Hello and welcome to a special 45 minute edition of Focus One. Today we're going to talk about the 2010 Gulf oil spill impacts and the state of recovery two years after the Deepwater Horizon accident. What happened to all of the oil? How has marine life been affected? What should we be on the lookout for in the coming years? What insights has the follow-up research on the Gulf impacts yielded to date? To help me get some answers to these questions, I brought together some of the best scientists in the world who, it just so happens, work right here in our community at Moat Marine Laboratory. Allow me to introduce them. First, we have Dr. Michael Crosby, Senior Research, sorry, Senior Vice President for Research at Moat Marine Laboratory. Dr. Richard Pierce, Senior Scientist at Moat Marine Laboratory. Dr. Bob Huter, Senior Scientist at Moat Marine Laboratory. All right. One of the, th the th difficult things is I think uh, all three of you are uh, both prominent senior scientists as well as senior administrators at, at Moat Marine Laboratory. So let me just, just give, give you a second to sort of clarify what your research area of expertise is and then just also mm -hmm. talk a little bit about where your administrative responsibilities are at, at Moat. Go first, Mike. Michael. Sure. Well, when I, when I used to spend much more time actually doing science rather than being an administrator for science, uh, my fields were in physiological ecology of invertebrates, uh, core coral reef ecology, and uh, fish behavior, uh, uh, primarily in the Pacific, a little bit in the Middle East as well. Richard. My background is in chemical oceanography. I, my research deals with the fate and the effects of toxic chemicals in the marine environment. Uh, I deal with a lot of analytical chemistry, that is being able to identify what's there and where it's going, but also I've been fortunate to be involved in the so what part, which is the toxicology, that is if the chemicals are there, what are they doing? And of course that's what we're concerned about, what are they doing and how are they doing it and how long will they be doing it? Uh, and um, so we're, we're looking at, at those aspects, uh, which includes the toxicology as well as the chemistry. Dr. Peter. Well, I'm known as the shark man at, at Moda. I'm sort of the heir to uh, Jeannie Clark, and who started the lab in 1955. I've been at the lab since 1988. Um, and um, I lead a program that studies sharks from every, everywhere from the inside out, looking at the molecular biology of the animals all the way to their ecology and behavior. Uh, work all over the world uh, looking at shark issues, a lot of which has to do with fisheries now. But a lot of our work is in the Gulf of Mexico. So when the oil spill happened in 2010, it led us to, to ask serious questions about the effects of, on sharks in the Gulf. And uh, also, I just want to come back administratively, uh, Michael, you, uh, the senior vice president for mm -hmm. the entire research apparatus mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. Moat Marine Laboratory. And then I think there are now three clusters. Uh, yeah, there, Mo Moat has restructured itself recently um, to uh, administratively organize its, its uh, research enterprise around three directorates. One focused on um, ecotoxicology or environmental uh, toxicology and ocean technology That's with Dr. It. Pierce is the associate vice president for. Uh, one that focuses on marine biology and conservation, which Dr. Huter um, uh, oversees as assistant uh, uh, associate vice president. And the third is fisheries and aquaculture, which Dr. Ken Lieber oversees. And one other thing I should add with respect to uh, Dr. Huter is, uh, in addition to being a senior scientist and the administrator for that directorate of marine biology and conservation, he's also the director of the National Center for Shark Research, which uh, is housed at Moat uh, through uh, enabling action by Congress in 1991. Okay, now we got that stuff out of the way. Uh, <laughs> let's cut to the chase, uh, Richard. An estimated 200 million gallons of oil were, rele were released from the, the Macondo well in uh, 2010. Where did it go? Well, that's a very good question, Frank. And uh, let me give a little background on what oil is so we can understand better what happens to it and where it goes when it gets in the marine environment. Uh, as you know, oil is a, a mixture, a solution of thousands of different chemicals, all the way from methane gas, which is the smallest 
molecule up to very heavy asphaltines or asphalt, which is in fact what we have on our roads. <laughs> yeah. uh, and in between, uh, we have uh, some light, mostly hydrocarbons containing hydrogen and carbon, obviously. Uh, we can look at that as maybe the uh, paint thinner type, uh, gasoline going up to kerosene, fuel oils, and then the heavy residual oils. All of these consist of just thousands of different organic compounds uh, that some of which when they get into the water they dissolve very quickly or they disperse very quickly. Some of them are lighter than water and so they float to the surface. Others will absorb onto particles and get heavier and sink to the bottom. So we have a very, as soon as oil gets in the water, we have what's called a dispersion and a transport process and then the weathering begins. And the weathering is the dissolution or the fractionation of the different types of chemicals uh, which then are dispersed and distributed throughout the water column. So having said that, the, the BP Deepwater Horizon uh, at the Macondo Well uh, was a, the deepest blowout or major spill that has ever occurred in the Gulf Nearly of Mexico. Nearly a mile below the surface. Yeah, well, a mile below the surface. Uh, all the other in the Gulf have occurred near the surface. So there's some very different environment down there. Very high pressure, very low temperatures, almost freezing temperatures. So oil acts differently down there. Had the oil spill occurred at the surface, there would have been a lot of evaporation of the volatiles, as they're called, uh, and, and a lot of oil on the surface, a lot of oiling. But since it occurred at such a depth under these pressures and temperatures, a lot of the, the gas, for example, methane, there was a lot of methane gas that came out. It immediately was converted to hydrates, water hydrates, and dispersed mm -hmm. at depth. Uh, very little methane made it to the surface. Mm -hmm. And then what are called the volatiles, uh, the, uh, the light um, gases, as well as the you know, gasoline-type things, things like benzene and toluene, which are very, very uh, toxic, but also quite water-soluble. They dispersed at depth and, and were solubilized at depth, and very few of those made it to the surface. And the, as the crisis unfolded, uh, the injection of dispersant at the right. wellhead complicated things a little bit further, mm. right? Or introduced an additional layer of uncertainty it, in terms of what was happening. Yes, yes. The, the dispersant, of course, is a detergent-like suite of chemicals, and its intent is to disperse the oil in the water enhanced dissolution but also dispersed into tiny particles which have much higher surface area therefore they're more readily biodegradable that is the microorganisms can consume them get, get rid of them quicker one of the main reasons for doing that is to reduce the amount of oil that actually makes it to the surface because if you have a lot of oil at the surface you have a lot of slicks you have a lot of oiling of marine mammals of birds of sea turtles which we saw a lot of but whatever is dispersed at the surface then doesn't make it uh, whatever is dispersed at depth then doesn't, doesn't make, make it to the surface. So that's mm -hmm. the reason why the dispersion is used. Uh, so a lot of those chemicals then were dispersed with the Corexit dispersant uh, into teeny tiny particles which then were distributed or transported at depth and then also a lot of them that were, were not dispersed at depth continued on the rise towards the surface and so then we had a lot at the surface. Uh, and we had of, some of plumes the, too that were just sort of hanging out in between. Those right? were the ones that were distributed at depth, which uh, had uh, what would be called neutral, nutrient, nutri <laughs> uh, neutral uh, buoyancy, so that uh, they didn't go up or down. Mm -hmm. They stayed mm -hmm. there, and then over time they'd be dispersed and uh, microbially degraded uh, over time. There was some concern that the microbial degradation at depth would remove all of the oxygen. There were some observations of oxygen reduction, but not to the point, it was not observed to the point of being a dangerous. So we uh, haven't seen huge yeah. dead zones? Not as a result of the um, microbial degradation of the oil, no, we have not. There are some areas where heavy amounts of oil has sunk to the bottom and oiled bottom uh, reefs, some, some deep water um, corals that in fact now are dead zones, but not because of the anoxia or the, the removal of oxygen. Bob, you want to jump in? Well, I, just one way to think about how much of this oil was actually at depth as opposed to the surface. Uh, 200 million gallons were released in this, in this incident. And um, the other incident that people remember is the, is the Exxon Valdez spill in Prince William Sound in uh, Alaska in 1989, and that spill, or the, the Deepwater Horizon spill, 
released 20 times the amount of oil that was involved That's in Prince William's. 20, 20 Exxon Valdez's. 20 times. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, at the surface, the, the surface area that was affected in the Gulf spill is only about three times what it was up in Prince William Sound. So that kind of shows you that 20 times the oil, but only three times at the surface means there's a lot of oil that was still left down below. And so how, help me work through how much uncertainty there remains with respect to how much of this stuff has not degraded yet. So, I mean, I know you can't answer that question with a level of precision or specificity that you would, you would like, but um, what do we know about those, those uh, weathering or decomposition processes given that a lot of the oil may have never made it to the surface? And is, just, is there a lot of nasty stuff still sitting at the bottom of the sea? No, or we just don't know? Well, there's a lot of research going on right now, a lot of monitoring to try to answer those questions. And, and Bob had some very good points uh, that he, he added there. In November of 2010, the um, Unified Command made an estimate, uh, published an estimate of where they thought the oil had gone at that point. And they said, well, about 25% uh, of it is residual. That is, it's, it's up in the marshes, it's on the beaches, it's on the surface. About 25% of it has been dispersed. And then another 25% of it either, either evaporated or dissolved, which whatever dissolved is dispersed. <laughs> and then about, I think it was something like 5% was burned, about 3% was actually skimmed and, mm -hmm. and recovered, which is not very much. And then about 8% they think was chemically dispersed, but they don't really have a good handle on that. So in essence, what that tells us is more than 50% of it, as of November, was probably still in the environment somewhere. That has been degrading over time. The, the plumes, the deep water plumes that were there, which consisted mostly of the lighter organic compounds, are probably pretty well microbially uh, degraded within a couple months, according to some of the monitoring that was going on. But there's still at least 25 and, uh, percent, that would be 50 million gallons, and probably more, that's still in the environment, either on the bottom, deep, or in the marshes, and and buried within the beaches. Now, there's been a lot of cleanup going on, mm -hmm. but still, mm -hmm. uh, there's still quite a lot out there, and, and when storms come through, people are reporting that there's, they can see oil coming back up and floating in the marshes and getting back on the beaches. So there's still quite a lot to A lot out there. Um, Bob, how is this affecting marine life? And I you know, start in one area and maybe go to a few different other, uh, different types of species. Uh, but well, <clears throat> you know, typical scientist answer, it depends. Um, um, it certainly has affected the ecology of the Gulf in a, in a very profound way, but it depends on where you, where you look and, and what you're looking at. Uh, in, in those coastal areas of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, where the oil was pretty much transported, um, there's profound effects that are, that are appearing in everything from um, the marshes through invertebrates to up to fish. And the, the research is not complete yet, so we don't have final answers to all this, but there are problems that are appearing uh, in fish populations and on up um, into things like marine mammals and dolphins, which uh, have, have stranded and, and come in dead in, in extraordinarily high numbers. And the process of trying to tie this directly to the spill is, is, is still ongoing. So those coastal areas where the oil did come in, uh, there were definite effects. The deep water zone around the well uh, is still being studied, but scientists have discovered uh, things like dead patches of coral where they're pretty much covered with, with oil at, at great depths. Mm -hmm. uh, these deep water corals that are, that are probably endangered species to begin with. And then one of the things that, that my group has studied is the more um, open ocean type fishes like sharks and tunas and, and billfish. Uh, we've been studying those for the last two years. And we've sampled those out in, in areas around and southeast of the, of the well, as, as well as uh, more coastally down here in Florida in areas that weren't affected. And we're seeing some effects. We're looking more for the, the sort of the subtle, sublethal effects rather than outward deaths from the, from the oil spill. But so far, we haven't found a real smoking gun in, in that group of fishes, uh, which probably means that they were 
spared and that they, they could move away from the oil. These, these highly migratory species like, like tunas and, and sharks. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're continuing to investigate this. Um, one of the things <clears throat> that we heard about, or just maybe you can clarify some of the stories with the, the dolphins, I think um, mortality events, uh, I think I heard that it might have been because uh, there was a die off in some of the forage fish that they eat. Uh, and then I've also heard things, uh, or I think read reports, that there's speculation that uh, although the oil might not have killed uh, dolphins directly, it might have uh, weakened immune systems that then uh, allowed uh, some other shock to the system. Are all these things speculative or? Well, they're not, they're not speculative, but, it, but the story, the answer is incomplete at this point. Um, our labs are looking at all those things that you mentioned, effects on the immune system, effects on, on genes, effects on reproductive uh, capability, um, and, and overall health of these animals. So we really don't, I don't think we have a final answer to that yet. One thing to keep in mind, going back to the Exxon Valdez lesson, is that it took about 10 years for some of these more profound effects to really reveal themselves in the ecosystem up there. When you're talking about things like loss of forage fish, loss of prey. Um, there was an effect that took a while to manifest itself in, in Alaska of, of uh, basically a, a failure of, I think it's herring to reproduce up in, up in that bay. And that eventually led to a real um, disaster in the killer whale population, the, the top predators, because they didn't have the, the, the fish Yeah, I recall eat. reading something about that. So yeah. um, a lot of these things, you know, the, the, Quite frankly, the easiest thing to, to, to document are the, the killed animals that are at the surface. Um, and we had certainly had lots of that. But the more profound changes, the longer term changes, are the sublethal effects or the effects that occur down deep that are going to take a long while to, to be revealed. I think it, uh, this is an important point, so I want to hit it again. I mean, the, the idea that it's going to take some time for us to figure out what, you know, what the long-term impacts are as things work their way uh, through the ecosystem. Now, uh, Michael, I recall um, you at one point, I think there was, if there was a, a, a conference or at least mm -hmm. a workshop on this, this concept of trophic cascades, which mm -hmm. I think gets at, you know, it takes a time mm -hmm. for things to work their way through the ecosystem. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Um, um, if I can just back up <clears throat> for one second um, here to put things in perspective, um, you know, in April two th 2010, um, you had the blowout occur. There are 11 human beings lost their life. That was an extremely tragic event in and of itself. And then you have the heart-wrenching scenes of oiled birds, sea turtles uh, from the surface slicks. Terrible, disastrous. Um, but what really, I believe, and many scientists and many, many fishermen, uh, many crabbers, uh, shrimpers, fishermen, believe will be the more long-term chronic impact is going to be the trophic cascading impacts that we're seeing. Um, you've heard both of my colleagues uh, talking about the, the breadth and literally depth of the impacts of, of the oil through the dispersion, the fact that it was a blowout at such a deep, deep level, um, and all of the different habitats that are being impacted. Um, the deep water corals that we were just discussing a minute ago, it's, it's terrible that the coral themselves have been lost. These are long-lived coral species take decades to, to grow up. They also serve as critical habitat for important fisheries. And so when you lose that habitat, that impacts the fishery. And if you can imagine a set of dominoes laid in a line, and I'm sure when you were, you know, we were all children, we used to play this little game, and you push the one, and all the rest of them go falling down. Mm -hmm. That really is the analogy for trophic cascades. And you don't have to have a PhD to see this. Mm -hmm. Literally, within weeks of the blowout event, I'm reading newspapers here in Sarasota and the fishing columns from the fishermen and there's all these little accounts of, well, we're noticing a lot of larger pelagics that we normally find far offshore. They're very close to shore. Why is that happening? We're noticing a lot of uh, fish, a lot of turtles, a lot of marine mammals that we don't normally see in and around the piers in much closer to shore. Why is that happening? They're moving out of the way. They're moving out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, this is common sense, you know, and I, I agree with Dr. Huter that the, the jury's still out on the scientific evidence to positively link 
uh, at, a, at a high level of, of confidence, statistical confidence, the linkages between uh, the blowout and these various events that we're seeing, whether it's mammal um, uh, fetal deaths, uh, where you're having spontaneous abortions, uh, uh, animals washing up on shore, but common sense and, and observation of fishermen, uh, whether they're recreational or commercial, clearly indicates to me that there is the beginnings of this trophic cascade, this domino effect. Can you give us maybe a couple of examples um, that I'd, I'll be clear in framing them uh, not as actual mm. cascades that yeah. we have yeah. confirmation of, but just potential uh, mm -hmm. linkages that we would consider potential cascades that mm -hmm. could happen that we want to, again, ask some questions about. Okay, so uh, we'll use some analogies from terrestrial systems to begin with. Okay. If you have a major top predator, such as a wolf, that for whatever reason, hunting, whatever, uh, no longer exists in an area, that wolf's prey species population is relieved of the predation, so they grow. Uh, the population expands. And the population then has impact on its food, mm -hmm. herbivory. Okay. Now, move into the marine environment, just in a, in a scenario here we'll, we'll present, is you have deep water pelagic predators that are moving closer to shore. Well, when they move closer to shore, they're gonna eat. So what are they gonna eat? They're gonna eat the things that are closer to shore. Mm -hmm. And the things they eat then are no longer gonna be eating the things they used to eat. Mm -hmm. Now imagine for, for and this is just all hypothetical, okay? All right. hypothetical here. But imagine for instance that we have red tide events that occur on the coast of Florida. Well, red tide is a, is a phytoplankton, okay? And fish eat phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, fish that eat these phytoplankton, there's, there's, there's a controlling factor to keep the population down. What happens if a predator moves in from offshore that normally isn't in the shallower waters? Eats that fish that eats the red tide, all of a sudden you get population. Tide, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's that kind, and I'm not saying that is, I, I know, you know, know, this is just a scenario as an example, yeah. as examples. But it can also work bottom up. Now you heard Dr. Pierce talk to you about the dispersion of oil and the breakdown of oil. And there is natural breakdown by bacteria of, of oil particles. But as those, that oil is dispersed into smaller and smaller particles which increase the surface area, that makes it more bioavailable to a number of different organisms that then can either adsorb or take up the toxic elements there. And it can be bioaccumulated up the food chain, mm -hmm. uh, similar to ciguatera. Uh, poisoning, but this is a toxic buildup. Mm -hmm. That could be happening. And then the third way you can have a trophic cascade, so you can have it from the top down, you can have it from the bottom up, and you can also have it if you uh, negatively impact keystone species. And the example that Dr. Huter used with the deep water corals is a, is a classic one. You're destroying a keystone species that is an essential fishery habitat. The organisms that use that habitat now are negatively impacted. So you can get trophic cascades from all of these different ways. Bob, yeah. <clears throat> let me add this to what Dr. Crosby said because, and I want to clarify something I said. I said that in our work, we're finding so far not serious problems in the, in the shark population, but I was referring to the offshore species, the, the, the big open ocean, highly migratory mm -hmm. animals that can move great distances. That's very different very different results are coming out for the, the inshore, the coastal sharks that have been sampled along the Alabama, Mississippi coast. The ones that really come all the way up to the, to the beach and in the marshes even. Uh, they're showing higher levels of these biomarkers, we call them, uh, kind of indications of, of oil contamination. So they may be, they may, may be more seriously affected mm -hmm. and we may have a, a, a problem in the shark population up there along the coast. Now, so what? So, so we lose the sharks, who cares? Well, you should care for the, th the reasons that Dr. Crosby laid out because as he talked about wolves on land, sharks are sort of the wolves of the sea. They're the top predators. And although we don't know what an oil spill does when it kills sharks, if it kills sharks, we do know that when sharks are removed from ecosystems, you have this effect that, he, that Dr. Crosby laid out of, from predator to prey to their prey and eventually down to the lowest levels. And in fact, in the, in the Caribbean, where sharks have been removed not by oil, but by overfishing, um, it, the effect has gone all the way down to the point where the actual coral reef has died because <coughs> algae overgrew the reef. The, the fish that were supposed to be there to crop the algae, to mow the lawn, were, were missing because the next mm -hmm. level up 
was what had overgrazed on them because the sharks weren't there to eat that level. Mm -hmm. So, um, as as Michael said, you don't need a PhD to figure these, these no, things this, out. No, you guys it's, did a real good job of clarifying. Pretty, I think it's some pretty of those, straightforward. Uh, yeah. All right, now, um, Richard, I want to come back to, to you because I might be sitting out there in our uh, audience and listening to you folks and saying, I'm not going to eat anything, man. This is really, uh, this is scaring me here in terms of uh, this broad level of contamination and everything that's out there, or that could be out there. Mm -hmm. um, should I be scared or what can you tell me, how can you reassure me, uh, uh, Dr. Pierce, that what I eat from uh, the Gulf is safe, especially sh shellfish, because I, I love shellfish. Well, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, scientists uh, from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration right. who are responsible for this. I know they're excellent scientists and I know that they're, they're doing an excellent job and I've asked them that same question. And uh, I, in, in my opinion, uh, yes, uh, the food is safe as long as it is you know, in, in a safe restaurant. I, I, I don't want to get anybody's business in trouble, but personally I would not, probably not go to Louisiana and buy shellfish along the side of the road. Uh, I would. Right. I think this is an important point that comes up sometimes yeah. even in the red tide um, uh, discussions, and I think that is the, the stringency of the protocols mm -hmm. that exist yep. to, to, to ensure that nothing contaminated gets into, the, into our, again, our, our distribution system or our food chain yep. in terms mm -hmm. of things that commercially or through the restaurants that, that you eat. And just want to reassure that, folks that, that, an, that that's a, a, the protocols that are out there to make sure that it doesn't happen are pretty darn strong. And they test it. First of all is they test the water to see if the contaminants are there and then they can close and open areas. There are areas that are still closed, especially you go up into Berteria Bay, areas like that where it was severely oiled, they don't allow collection of shellfish and, and fish there. Mm -hmm. But out in the open water that has been tested and it's continuously tested, that's safe. And then they test the products themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I believe that it is safe and I, I eat seafood. Yeah, and I, I just to add to that, I, I have the, the absolute highest confidence in the safety of uh, the seafood that is coming to uh, legitimate businesses, legitimate wholesalers, retailers of seafood throughout the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I eat fish several times a, a week, uh, local fish from here, um, and I, I think our food safety um, uh, agencies in, in the state and, and at the federal level do an outstanding job of ensuring that, uh, that uh, we have safe product here. So buy Gulf of Mexico <coughs> seafood. And I, I do. Um, uh, so if I'm in a restaurant uh, and, and or shopping at a supermarket, um, I, I can and I do feel 100% confident yeah. that what I'm yeah. eating is safe. What about some of the recreationally a targeted uh, species that might not go through again the restaurant or the uh, or the commercial chain. I like red snapper, you know, a, a grouper. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of the the inshore uh, species that uh, you know, redfish or, or mm -hmm. trout or something uh, like that. Are, are they safe to eat? Well, I think in this area where we're Absolutely. talking, you know, yeah. on the on the Florida coast, especially the Southwest Florida coast, it's fine. I mean, we we really didn't see effects right. down here as far as as we know. Um, when you go again to that northern, northeastern Gulf inshore region, there are some questions that have arisen with things like snappers, mm -hmm. snappers and groupers. But again, the government, the federal government is, is monitoring this and looking at this and trying to see if the effects are, are real. But I think you raise a good point. If, if recreational fishermen are, are catching these fish and they're not going through some kind of a, a monitoring process, um, who knows? I, I think I think people need to be a little bit careful up in those areas that were really mm -hmm. impacted, like as as Dr. Pierce said, Barataria Bay. Or maybe know just a little bit about what types of species mm -hmm. are more susceptible to mm -hmm. bioaccumulating, or you know, as opposed to other species. That I, I wanted to, if I can, expand a little bit on what Dr. Crosby said about the different uh, impacts. We have the very obvious oiled birds and, and turtles and that, and that's the acute, immediate uh, toxicity problems. But I think more more probably the long term more serious uh, are the subtle effects as Bob was talking about the immune function uh, mm -hmm. genetic impacts there's recent information out on the blogs that uh, these shrimp coming up with no eyes the uh, lesions on fish and mm -hmm. crabs without claws these are part of the long term uh, more sublethal impacts that we're concerned about uh, and they're probably occurring not only from exposure of that organism itself, but probably from exposure of that 
organism's mother and, and father mm -hmm. and then genetically being damaged. At the point at which the concentrations of some of these oil chemicals that can cause that are much lower than the concentrations that cause death or acute toxicity or that even would be accumulated to the point where they would harm people eating them. So we have to distinguish between how much does it take to cause genetic damage versus how much does it take to be toxic for something right. to eat it. And that, that's a much more complicated issue than is it safe or is it not. Yeah, very good, very good point. Uh, we touched upon dispersants uh, before, and I just want to swing back to that because that's one of the more common questions I, I, I get that was very controversial at the time, and there's still a lot of questions. Um, the, the president had a, a commission um, Bob Graham and uh, uh, Bill Riley were the, mm -hmm. the, the co-chairs of the commission that did an enormous amount of work um, and released a, a voluminous report um, in uh, January of 2011. One of the supplementary papers that I found interesting uh, looked directly at the dispersants and uh, they had asked, and this was at the time, you know, sort of in the wake of the accident, they asked themselves three questions. Um, did we know enough? Um, had, was the research at a level um, that we can make a, a reform, an informed risk decision mm. Um, mm. Uh, with respect to whether to use that dispersants in that volume at depth in particular. Mm. Mm. The second question was, uh, given what we knew, um, was this a reasonable decision that was, was made? And the third question was, in retrospect, might we come to regret this at, at, at mm. some point? Uh, and the report's answers to those questions on the first one was, no, we really didn't know enough. There should have been more research in place uh, that would have kind of gave us some better answers mm. uh, to what might happen uh, in this type of scenario. Second question, given what was known, it, it was a reasonable decision. Essentially what, you were, what was mm. being done was you were reducing risk right. that would be right. at the surface right. and on the coastal regions right. and accepting right. a higher level mm -hmm. risk sort of in the water column and mm -hmm. in the, at the sea bottom of the benthos. And then the third question again was, we'll just have to wait and see in terms of if we come to, re to regret this. Two years on now, um, did they get it right? I mean, would you agree with that assessment, or is there anything else that you think needs mm. to be pointed out? You know, that, that, that's a really um, tough, tough question. Um, and I don't know that you can answer the question, did they get it right, with a yes or a no. Um, you know, it's, it's always easy to play, you know, Monday morning quarterback, quarterback uh, and second guess <clears throat> decisions that had to be made very, very quickly. Um, but, you know, again, 200 million gallons of oil, 200 million gallons of oil, 20 times what has ever been released before. If that amount of oil had hit the surface and it hit the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, um, the disaster to the coastline would have been orders of magnitude greater. So it, it's a tough decision, a tough, tough answer to, to come up with, yes, yes or no. There is no question, no question from, from research that, that has been done at Moat and other places, but uh, just as an example, the impact of the dispersant and the oil um, is, is, is um, uh, highly detrimental uh, to coral. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Huter mentioned a, a, a moment ago that here in southwest Florida in particular, you know, the fish, our, our coastline was, was very lucky. We, we didn't get hit with uh, uh, an obvious visible major slick. Um, one of the reasons we didn't get hit with an obvious visible slick was because the normal circulation patterns right, right, right. Uh, weren't happening at that That's time. Right. So in that respect, this region of Florida lucked out. If they hadn't been that way, things would have been different. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you would have seen oil very likely going down uh, the west coast of Florida and over the Florida Keys. So we conducted research down there to look at the impacts of uh, the oil by itself, the dispersant by itself, and the oil and the dispersant together mm -hmm. on coral, on coral reproduction, on coral larvae, on coral settlement. And in each case, it was highly detrimental, wiping out uh, the settlement, so that if that oil had gone down there, we would have had serious problems to that entire ecosystem. Why I'm bringing that up right now? As we look to the future, we have to realize that our neighbor to the south f is currently planning, and it looks like implementing, oil drilling off the coast of Cuba yes. that is literally 50 miles away 
from the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, we have got to look to the future and we have got to work with them to make sure that we have plan. We need to learn from history. We need to learn from what happened with BP, the way we didn't apparently learn from, from Exxon Valdez. Mm -hmm. Four years, it took four years, and Dr. Huter touched on this, four years after Exxon Valdez, the herring population crashed never to recover. Many scientists now believe that that was directly linked to reproductive failure in year classes. The marine mammal populations have never come back to Exxon, to, to Prince William Sound. One very valuable outcome, uh, or result I should say, that the Congress took as a result of Exxon Valdez, which we haven't discussed yet, but has the potential to occur here and must occur here, is the establishment of a long-term endowment from the fine money from Exxon Valdez that to this day continues to support restoration, monitoring, and research uh, from the impacts of, of the Exxon Valdez. Let me use that as an opportunity to, again to, I mean, ask you to go over it one more time and I want to tease out, uh, this is a little bit complicated, but maybe mm -hmm. uh, four elements of a, of, of a, of a question. Mm -hmm. Give me a sense of, uh, the scale and the scope of the research effort now and the, you know, that's going on in the wake of this accident. Um, Moat's role within mm -hmm. that uh, effort, uh, you had just mentioned there's uh, potential legislation uh, mm -hmm. under the Restore Act, mm -hmm. which would provide, again, um, a bigger ch or take a larger portion of the fines, which are going to be, you know, uh, in the, you know, over maybe ten billion dollars or somewhere mm -hmm. between five mm -hmm. and, and the teens of mm -hmm. billion dollars, mm -hmm. a greater portion of that and redirect it toward the recovery effort. Because under the current law, if there is no change, most of that money would go back to just, you know, writing off the federal uh, debt. Um, and then, uh, will that effort be sufficient? If that is not done, are we just short of where we, you know, where we mm -hmm. need to be in terms mm -hmm. of what our research effort is? I know that's kind of a complicated question, but let me just get a couple of takes at it. I'm gonna go back to you, Michael, and then I'll- Well, um, uh, we'll take part A first uh, here. Um, currently, Moat has uh, somewhere on the order of about 20 active major formal research activities that are focused on um, the oil blowout and its ramifications. About two, a little over two million dollars uh, worth of uh, research that is going on. But even before the BP monies were available, I, I give great credit to, to the president of Moat, Dr. Kumar Mahadevan. The minute that oil spill happened, um, he said, let's get out there right now. Let's not worry about where the money's going. Let's send our team of scientists, our diverse group of scientists out there all along our coastline down here in the near shore waters to get baseline assessments. And there was no money that came up for that, but the community stepped up, which is a great thing, and mm -hmm. donated a significant amount of money to offset that. So we were out there even before the, the uh, funds were available through the Gulf mm -hmm. uh, Research Initiative. But we have about two million or so now that we have that is funding about uh, 20 projects. With respect to the Restore Act, I firmly believe that a significant amount, if not all of it, quite frankly, you're talking about between five to 18 billion dollars. If we don't take that money and put it in a permanent endowment, at least a significant amount of it, in five years, we will be right back where we are now, going to Congress, trying to get precious tax dollars to come down here to do research. Mm -hmm. Imagine for just a second, we follow the example of what Congress did after Exxon Valdez. We established a permanent endowment with only, say, 10 billion of this 18 billion, and let the government do whatever it wants with the other $8 billion. That $10 billion, if you were being very conservative like you would with, say, your retirement account and only take out 4% on the interest of that, you would have $400 million a year to support restoration, monitoring, and research in the Gulf of Mexico, and we wouldn't have to be going after taxpayer money. There's no way taxpayers should be paying for this, and it will be decades from now that we will need to continue doing this work. We need that money to go into a permanent endowment, and quite frankly, it shouldn't be under the federal government. It should be under an independent entity so it's done right. Anything to add to 
Well, and I think the endowment part, again, for the viewers is pretty important. It's not simply taking a big chunk of that money and then going to spend it on one wave of it'll, research. It'll but, get spent real quick. But the, the, the scale of that uh, amount, the, the amount of fines, will allow for a functional endowment that, right. uh, with, a, again, a conservative drawdown in terms of what you would spend each year in perpetuity um, could actually get a lot done. You yeah. could get a lot done. I mean, I couldn't agree more with, um, with what Dr. Crosby has said about the need for this moving forward, just as a kind of an example of our lack of information and why we need to, to establish baseline data. Uh, in my world of sharks, uh, when this happened and we wanted to start studying what the effects were, we were absolutely shocked to find that in all the scientific literature that exists, there's one paper on the effects of oil and the, and the mm -hmm. levels of oil contamination in sharks, and that was from the Persian Gulf. Wow. So we're really starting from, you know, ground zero and trying to try and understand the impacts. One of the things that that did uh, provide support for for early research was money that was, I guess, granted from BP. I don't know if we say that they presented it to us or whether it was mm -hmm. kind of. Coerced out of the Gulf them, of Mexico Research Initiative. The Gulf of yeah. Mexico Research Initiative, and uh, they, that funded a number of different entities working in the Gulf, including ten million dollars that went to uh, the state of Florida mm -hmm. to disperse in a fairly expeditious mm -hmm. um, fashion to uh, the marine research entities that that uh, exist ar around the state. And Moat was a recipient of, of, a, of mm -hmm. a few of those grants. Um, there's a new. There's a new uh, round of, of funding if, and with proposals that have been solicited and we've put in, I don't know how many proposals, but a, a number of them as well. Um, actually for our work, we're gonna move now, we're proposing to move from the field into the lab and try to understand a little bit more about what these sublethal effects are when you, when you expose animals to, to oil and dispersant. And we're hoping that that gets funded. So, there's been a lot of, of startup activity for, for research funding, but not near as near the level that's needed for us to understand really what the effects of a spill like this are and to advise what should be done in the future. So the big message I think we have here for the, for the viewers, um, they've had a lot of questions about uh, you know, where are we uh, two mm -hmm. years on. A lot of uncertainty there. Um, it's going to take some time to get mm -hmm. those questions answered, uh, and the research effort, sort of consistent and robust, is, you know, vital to, to that uh, effort. Yes. Given that, um, if we're running out of time, I'm coming to the close here. Uh, if uh, again, your audience or our audience is sitting there, just asking, you know, if there's one thing you wanted me to know about uh, where are we uh, in the Gulf two years after this accident. You know, what would you tell them that maybe we already covered uh, that you'd like to accentuate or maybe just one parting thought that you, uh, uh, you know, haven't gotten to yet? I'll just go right down the list. Um, uh, I suppose the take home message I would like to give is, is two part. One is we have not yet begun to see the full ramifications of that blowout and it will likely occur over the next several decades. The second part is it is absolutely critical that we establish a permanent endowment with that fine money so that we have the uh, basis for doing the work, the restoration, the monitoring and research that we need, and we never have to have the taxpayers foot the bill for that. Pierce. Well, <clears throat> quickly, as, as bad as it was, it's not as bad as it could have been, as mm. Dr. Crosby said, if the normal uh, circulation patterns of the Gulf had continued. Um, the research, long-term research is critical. The proactive research, the mm -hmm. question to Corexit is an example. Mm -hmm. Had the research been done on deep water use of Corexit when they started mm -hmm. deep water drilling, we would not have had such a problem as mm -hmm. we have now. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, I'm, I'm just concerned that the sort of the attention span of the public mm -hmm. is, is very short and because it's no longer you know, on the, on the nightly news that people think that the oil has, has gone away and, and as, I, as I've heard often said that we dodged a bullet. And I say we didn't dodge a bullet, we took a bullet and we're still in the process, mm -hmm. the process of assessing how, how bad the wound is. And as my colleagues have said, it's, it's going to take a long time to, to do that. And meanwhile, there's this continuing pressure to go back to, to deep sea drilling and has anything really changed since two years ago? Has, has have the safety 
margins been decreased or, or increased, I guess. That's a whole guess. nother discussion. So, that's, awesome. so that's, what, that's what my concern is, to, to, for everyone to stay aware and to think that, that we, didn't, uh, we didn't dodge that bullet, but we're, we're trying to assess how bad the wounds are. Dr. Crosby, Dr. Pierce, Dr. Huter, thank you so much for joining us oh, on this thank edition of Focus One. And thank you to our viewers. We'll see you next week on another edition of Focus One.